Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. When I hear those words, I think about lenses. That's right. Lenses filter our sight. Lenses color our perception. Lenses conform us to this world. Jesus offered his followers a new lens. He said, you have heard this, but I say to you this. You see this, but I see this. Through Jesus' eyes, those who had been called outcasts now had an equal place at the table. And Paul went through a transformation of his lenses, didn't he? At first, he perceived the Christian movement as a nuisance that needed to be persecuted and stamped out. And then he had a transformative moment in which he saw through Jesus' eyes and he was never the same. He changed his ways and he became an activist for the Christian movement instead of against it. Christ is still at work among us today, calling us to transform our minds, calling us to let ourselves be transformed by the renewing of our minds. How on earth do we do that? Let's start by learning how our lenses work. When we are born and when we first open our eyes, we are bombarded by an infinite array of colors, shapes, and sounds, and we have no idea what belongs to what, what sense to make of it all. And then our quickly pattern-forming brain starts to pick out our caregiver's voice. And in our caregiver's voice, we start to pick out individual words. We start to make sense of those words. And those words, alongside all our other experiences, shape our perception of reality. When people in the English-speaking world draw a rainbow, they draw it with seven stripes. Why is this? Because of the seven words that separate an infinite color spectrum into seven basic colors. But in Russia, rainbows are drawn with eight stripes because in the Russian language, dark blue is a completely different, unrelated word from light blue. Just like red and pink are two completely different words in English. So we wrap words and concepts around reality and the sense we make is sense we learn to make from the categories we inherit from our ancestors. When I was young, I learned the concepts good and bad. I remember marching out of the front door of my house when I was about three. My older brother was playing in the sand out in front of our house. And I was taunting him. I'm good and you're bad. I'm good and you're bad. And pretty soon I got a fistful of sand in my face, which my babysitter then helped me wash out very tenderly. All of a sudden, I was the victim and being treated as such, and my perception of reality, that I was good and my brother was bad, was firmly cemented. Although I did learn that perhaps I shouldn't say those words out loud, and so I stopped taunting, but I still kept believing the taunt. Even though, as a child, I also learned that we're all equally complex and unconditionally loved. I had this contradictory concept that I was a good girl and my obedience next to my brother's rebellion cemented that perception through the way people treated us. Since we have a lens through which we see ourselves, we tend to hold on to the evidence that confirms our self-perception and sweep away the evidence that would disprove it. 
but sometimes the way we perceive ourselves can change. The way Paul's perception of himself changed on the road to Damascus, his mind renewed, his life transformed. Those of us who identify with some variation of queer sexuality may identify with a moment when we took our sexuality out of a box and saw it with more complexity. When I did this, when I took myself out of the straight box, if you will, I was able to finally stop sweeping away the evidence that I'm attracted to women as well as men. My mind was renewed and my life was transformed. Right now, at this very moment, I am going through another lens shift, which is transforming the way that I live my life. I started just recently, about a year ago now, participating in conversations around racial justice. These conversations conjured up for me many memories in which I had witnessed other white people acting on racist impulses. I knew that racism was still very much an issue in our country, and I was relieved that we were finally talking about it. But before long, I could see that there had been something off about my own perception because I was noticing error in everyone else's way, but not my own. I could see how other people's perception of race affected their behavior, but I couldn't see how my own perception of race affected my own behavior. I knew that I must have blind spots, but I didn't know where they were, and I didn't know why I couldn't find them. It took me going back to that early memory of taunting my brother and discovering my good girl lens. The lens that shows me all the evidence that I'm a good person and filters out any evidence that I might be more complex than that. This lens through which I see myself, that I hold on to anxiously because of those early experiences, has blocked me from being able to see my own participation in this country's system of race. But once I began to dislodge the good person lens and see myself as more complex, then I could begin to notice the ways my perspective is subsumed into a culture of white supremacy, of believing in power over, in seeking to gain power over, and in defensive protection of my own tenuous system position within that system. The part of me that is subsumed into that culture has caused me to do harm many times and in many ways. I have done harm by simply refusing to see the power dynamic at play in my budding relationships with people of color expecting them to take care of me and my feelings when tensions arise around race. I have done harm by narrowly seeking after my own security while believing my child's life was more important for me to protect than every child's life. I have done harm by believing I wasn't capable of seeking after everyone's liberation when I sought after my own. I want to stop harming. I need to examine my white lens. I need to listen to those who can familiarize me with my blind spots so that I can participate in making a way forward where there will be less harm. So this morning, I simply ask of you this, that you join me in soberly examining your own lenses. 
through which you view yourself and the world so that we may begin to be transformed, so that we may join in that turning like Paul's turning and move towards healing work in this world. What lenses do you have? How do they interact with each other and filter your sense of reality? In this version of a miraculous birth narrative, let us notice that the miracle here is being carried out by a network of women, the midwives, Moses' mother, Moses' sister, the Pharaoh's daughter, and the Pharaoh's daughter's maid. And so for Moses, his first experience of God moving in his life didn't feel like a male patriarchal god. It felt like a goddess, the goddess midwife's hands disobeying the pharaoh, the goddess mother finding a way to nurse her son against all odds, the goddess sister watching by, the goddess maid figuring out a way for Moses' mother to nurse him in this broken and life-threatening system. The goddess in Pharaoh's daughter who was not being a good daughter to her dad. Through this miracle orchestrated by these women, let us also notice that there is still tragedy. There were still countless children's lives literally thrown away. Moses still had to leave his mother when he was three. He still had his culture stripped from him. This isn't the picture of liberation. This is just the beginning. Alicia Garza, Patrice Coolers, and Opal Tometi came together in 2013 to build an organization called Black Lives Matter. It was in response to the killing of Trayvon Martin and the acquittal of his murderer. Today, this organization has chapters all around the world and it has helped to fuel a movement for black lives, but it isn't doing it alone. Black Lives Matter is one organization participating in a much bigger collective of Black-led organizations. These organizations representing thousands of Black people across the country have come together to form the Movement for Black Lives. No one is vying for control over this movement. Rather, the movement demonstrates what Alicia Garza has articulated, that at once obvious and radical truth, that we can all be powerful. If I see the spirit of Christ alive and at work anywhere in the world right now, I see it here. In what Pamela Lightsey, the black queer womanist theologian calls a leader full movement. Here are a few quotes from the Movement for Black Lives website. Black humanity and dignity requires black political will and power. Despite constant exploitation and perpetual oppression, black people have bravely and brilliantly been the driving force pushing the U.S. towards the ideals it articulates, but has never achieved. We are a collective that centers and is led by and rooted in Black communities, and we recognize our shared struggle with all oppressed people. Collective liberation will be a product of all of our work. We are intentional 
about amplifying the particular experiences of racial, economic, and gender-based state and interpersonal violence. That Black women, queer, trans, gender non-conforming, intersex, and disabled people face. I believe that this movement, these organizations, these leaders are where we need to look to learn how to leave no one out, to learn how to dismantle racism. This movement and their brilliant way of modeling exactly the kind of liberation they call for is transforming our world. Because George Floyd's life mattered, because Breonna Taylor's life mattered, because Atatiana Jefferson's life mattered, because Aura Roser's life mattered, because Devon Clark's life mattered, because Botham Jean's life mattered, because Philando Castile's life mattered, because Alton Sterling's life mattered, because Michelle Cousseau's life mattered, because Trayvon Martin's life mattered, because Black lives matter, Black trans lives matter, Black queer lives matter, Black immigrant lives matter, Black disabled lives matter, Black homeless lives matter, Black incarcerated lives matter. All Black Lives Matter.